Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to my afternoon reading. Um, I've been trying to do this at 4.30 uh, Eastern Daylight Time every day, and I've been, in the last few days, uh, reading an essay by Dr. C.G. Young entitled The Spirit of Psychology. It appears in Spirit and Nature, papers from the Aranos Yearbooks, edited by Joseph Campbell, published by Princeton University Press. And uh, today I'll be reading part four. This part actually talks about what are the differences between Jungian psychology and Freudian psychology, and you can start to get a sense of it. The Spirit of Psychology, Part 4, Instinct and Will. Whereas in the course of the 19th century, the main concern was to put the unconscious on a philosophical footing, towards the end of the century, various attempts were made in different parts of Europe, more or less simultaneously and independently of one another, to understand the unconscious experimentally and empirically. The pioneers in the field were Pierre Janet in France and Sigmund Freud in the old Austria. Janet made himself famous for his investigation of the formal aspect, Freud for his researches into the content of psychogenic symptoms. I'm not in a position here to describe in detail the transformation of unconscious contents into conscious ones, so must content, content myself with hints. So must content myself with hints. Uh, that's because he wrote an entire book of the collected works of C.G. Young, volume five, uh, which is on that topic, the transformation of the psyche. In the first place, the structure of psychogenic symptoms was successfully explained on the hypothesis of unconscious processes. Freud, starting from the symptomology of the neuroses, made out a plausible case for dreams as the mediators of unconscious contents. What he elicited as contents of the unconscious seemed, on the face of it, to consist mainly of elements of a personal nature that were quite capable of consciousness and had therefore been conscious under other conditions. It seemed to him that they had got repressed on account of their morally incompatible nature. Hence, like forgotten contents, they had once been conscious and had become subliminal and more or less unrecoverable owing to the counter effect exerted by the attitude of the conscious mind. By suitably concentrating the attention and letting oneself be guided by associations, that is by the pointers still existing in consciousness, the associative recovery of lost contents went forward as in a mnemonic, men, uh, <laughs> but not technical exercise. But whereas, but whereas forgotten contents were unrecoverable because of their lowered threshold value, repressed contents owed their relative unrecoverability to a check exercised by the conscious mind. This initial discovery logically led to the interpretation of the unconscious as a phenomenon of repression, which could be understood in personalistic terms. In con its contents were lost elements that had once been conscious. Freud later acknowledged the continu ex continued existence of archaic vestiges in the form of primitive modes of functioning, though even these were explained personalistically. On this view, the unconscious psyche appears as a subliminal appendix to the conscious mind.
the contents that Freud raised to consciousness are those which the most easily are those which are the most easily recoverable because they have the capacity to become conscious and were originally conscious. The only thing they prove with respect to the unconscious psyche is that there is a psychic limbo somewhere beyond consciousness. Forgotten contents which are still recoverable prove the same. This would tell us next to nothing about the nature of the unconscious psyche did there not exist an undoubted link between these contents and the instinctual sphere. We think of the latter as physiological, as in the main a function of the glands. The modern theory of internal secretions and hormones lends the strongest support to this view. But the theory of human instincts finds itself in a rather delicate situation because it is uncommonly difficult not only to define the instincts, not only to define the instincts conceptually, but even to establish their number and their limitations. In this matter, opinions diverge. All that can be ascertained with any certainty is that the instincts have a physiological and a psychological aspect of great use of at, of great use for description purposes is Pierre Janet's view of the superior part and the inferior part function. And the inferior function. I'm not. I'm translating this from the French, so I apologize for that. He, he actually said, "Partie supérieure." a inferior bon function. So you see how bad my French accent is. I apologize for that. But Genet was talking about a superior part and an inferior part within the psyche. Uh, today, we would talk about the superior part as the self in Jungian psychology and the inferior part as the ego. The fact that all the psychic process is access accessible to our observation and experience are somehow bound to an organic substrate indicates that they are articulated with the life of the organism as a whole and therefore partake of its dynamism. In other words, they must have a share in its instincts or be in a certain sense the results of the action of those instincts. This is not to say that the psyche derives exclusively from the instinctual fear sphere. This is not to say that the psyche derives exclusively from the instinctual sphere and hence from an organic substrate. The psyche as such cannot be explained in terms of physiological chemistry, if only because together with life itself, it is the only natural factor capable of converting statistical organizations, which are subject to natural law into higher and unnatural states. In opposition to the rule of entropy that runs throughout the inorganic realm, how life produces complex organic systems from the, in how life produces complex organic systems from the inorganic, we do not know, though we have direct experience of how the psyche does it. Life therefore has a special law of its own, which cannot be deduced from the known physical laws of nature. Even so, the psyche is to some extent dependent upon processes in the organic substrate. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I looked up at the, um, okay, sorry, I looked up at the chat and lost my place. Uh, welcome, Oleg. Uh, I'll, I'll be coming back to any comments at the end of this. So I'll reread the last sentence and continue. Even so, the psyche is to some extent dependent upon processes in the organic substrate. 
At all events, it is highly probable that this is so. The instinctual base governs the partie inferieure, the inferior part of the function, while the partie supérieure, the superior, corresponds to its predominantly psychic compact component. The partie inferior proves to be the relatively unalterable automatic part of the function, and the partie superior, the voluntary and alternative alterable part. The question now arises, when are we entitled to speak of psychic and how in general do we define the psychic as distinct from the physiological? Both are life phenomena, but they differ in that the functional component characterized as the inferior part has an unmistakably physiological aspect. This is the ego. Its existence or non-existence seems to be bound up with the hormones. Its functioning has a compulsive character, hence the designation drive. River, uh, Rivers asserts that the all or none reaction to, is natural to it, i.e. the function acts altogether or not at all, which is specific of compulsion. On the other hand, the part, the superior part, which is best described as psychic and is moreover sensed as such, has lost its compulsive character, can be subjected to the will, and even apply, applied in a manner contrary to the original instinct. From these reflections, it appears that the psychic is an emanation of function from its instinctual form, and so from the compulsiveness, which as sole determinant of the function causes it to harden into a mechanism. The psychic condition or quality begins where the function loses its outer and inner determinism and becomes capable of more extensive and freer application. That is where it begins to show itself accessible to a will motivated by other sources. So this would be, for example, uh, your heartbeat or your breathing, uh, those functions are not in general alterable, although some Tibetan monks say they can uh, adjust their heartbeat, but most of us can't do that. Um, but other functions we can control to a lesser, or bigger degree. At the risk of anticipating my program, my program, I cannot refrain from pointing out that if we delimit, delimit the psyche from the physiological sphere of instinct at the bottom, so to speak, a similar delimitation imposes itself at the top. For with increasing freedom from sheer instinct, the partie superior, the superior part, will ultimately reach a point at which the intrinsic energy of the function ceases altogether to be oriented by instinct in the original sense and attains a so-called spiritual form. This does not imply a substantial alteration of the motive power of instinct, but merely a different mode of application. The meaning or purpose of the instinct is not unambiguous as the instinct may easily mask a sense of direction other than biological, which only becomes apparent in the course of development. Within the psychic sphere, the function can be deflected through the action of the will and modified in a great variety of ways. This is possible because the system of instincts is not truly harmonious in composition and is exposed to numerous internal collisions. One, of, one instinct disturbs and displaces the other, and although taken as a whole, it is the instincts that make individual life possible, their blind compulsive character affords frequent, frequent occasion for mutual injury. Differentiation of function from compulsive instinctuality and its voluntary application are of paramount importance in the maintenance of life. 
but this increases the possibility of collision and produces cleavages, the very dissociations which are forever putting the unity of consciousness in jeopardy. In the psychic sphere, as we have seen, the will influences the function. It does this by virtue of the fact that it is itself a form of energy and has the power to overcome another form. In this sphere, which I define as psychic, the will is in the last resort motivated by instincts, not of course absolutely, otherwise it would not be a will, which by definition must have a certain freedom of choice. Will implies a certain amount of energy freely disposable by the psyche. There must be such amounts of disposable libido or energy or modifications of the functions would be impossible since the latter would then be chained to the instincts which are in themselves extremely conservative and correspondingly unalterable so exclusively that no so exclusively that no variations could take place unless it were organic variations as we have already said the motivation of the will must in the first place be regarded as essentially biological. But at the permitting such an expression, upper limit of the psyche, where the function breaks free from its original goal, the instincts lose their influence as movers of the will. Through having its form altered, the function is pressed into the service of other determinants or motivations, which apparently have nothing further to do with the instincts. What I am trying to make clear is the remarkable fact that the will cannot transgress the bounds of the psychic sphere. It cannot coerce the instinct, nor has it power over the spirit, insofar as we understand by this something more than the intellect. Spirit and instinct are by nature autonomous and both limit in equal measure the applied field of the will. Later I shall show what constitutes the relation of spirit to instinct. Just as in its lower reaches the psyche loses itself in the organic material substrate, so in its upper reaches it resolves itself into a spiritual form about which we know as little as we do about the functional basis of the instinct what I would call the psychic psyche proper extends to all functions which can be brought under the influence of a will. Pure instinctuality allows no consciousness to be conjectured and needs none. But because of its empirical freedom of choice, the will needs a sub- superordinate authority, something like a consciousness of itself in order to modify the functions it must know of a goal different from the goal of the function. Otherwise, it would coincide with the driving force of the function. Dreisch rightly emphasizes there is no willing without knowing. Volition volition presupposes a choosing subject who envisages different possibilities. Looked at from this angle, psyche is essentially conflict between blind instinct and will, freedom of choice. Where instinct predominates, psychoid psychoid processes set in which pertain to the sphere of the unconscious as elements incapable of consciousness. The psychoid process is not the unconscious as such, for this has a far greater extension Apart from psychoid processes, there are in the unconscious ideas and volitional acts, and something akin to conscious processes. But in the instinctual sphere, these phenomena retire so far into the background that the term psychoid is probably justified. If, however, we restrict the psyche to acts of the will, we arrive at the conclusion that psyche is more or less identical with consciousness, for we can hardly conceive of will and freedom of choice without consciousness. 
this apparently brings us back to where we always stood to the axiom psyche equals consciousness. What then has happened to the postulated psychic nature of the unconscious? Okay, so that concludes my reading of part four of the spirit of psychology, uh, instinct and will, uh, which is in this book, Spirit and Nature, uh, papers from the Ernest Yearbooks, edited by Joseph Campbell, published by Princeton University Press. There are six books that Campbell uh, edited from the Ernest Yearbooks uh, that are all this thick. <laughs> and, um, and these uh, people who got together, many of them were theologians, uh, various kinds of philosophers from all over the world uh, to include people like uh, D.T. Suzuki, who wrote the book on Zen, um, uh, and many, many others, 70 others over time. Uh, this particular essay that appears in volume one of this series, there are two Jungian essays in this book, um, but this particular essay uh, was published or read at the Aramos Conference in 1945 or 1946. Unfortunately, this year's Aramos Conference, which I was planning to attend <laughs> between the 23rd and 26th of April, uh, has been canceled and hopefully we'll be able to conduct it in a year from now. And so keep put that in your mind because it may be that you could participate in it. I think it's limited, uh, it was limited this year to about 150 people. And of those a fairly good number of people that are, in, are invited to attend, uh, and then they do have a little bit of room for some uh, laymen to attend. And some laymen have made big um, contributions to Aranos over the time. Aranos uh, literally means a feast to which you bring something. In this case, um, they were bringing a paper uh, and Many of these conferences were um, held during very rough times. They began in 1933 uh, during the Great Depression and continued through World War II in Ascona, Switzerland. And um, so they were a very close, tight-knit group of people who were holed up in Zurich mainly uh, during the war years, the Second World War years. And so as we go forward here, uh, there are destined to be groups like this that are going to continue to think um, as uh, time goes on. Uh, but there is nothing like the Aronos Conference that occurred in the 20th century. Um, so I'll now look at your chats. Um, So James Sizemore says, love, serve, remember, namaste. That's a very good thing to remember in these difficult times. Uh, and Marcus Flores says, hey, Skip. Hi, Marcus, thank you for coming. And uh, Oleg and Renan, thank you for being here too. Oleg says, about instincts, sometimes you can find an inter on internet some scientists which are saying that instincts are, are not exist, what do you think about such scientists? Well, um, I don't know. Um, what do you think about your instinct of hunger? <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> you know? They can't deny that we all eat. Bernard says, how much of what we do is really unconscious, I wonder. Um, I, my estimate is 95%. Um, 
your body is doing so many things unconsciously. Um, obviously, your heartbeat and your breathing are two of those things that take place uh, 7 by 24 by 365 all through your life. And another thing that happens is that with the exception of your bones, uh, your body replaces itself every seven years. So the atoms that are in and the molecules that are in your body today uh, do not did not exist seven years ago. You're a completely different uh, person since then. Uh, but somehow the psyche continues on and you can have memories from before that time. Um, and uh, Grant says, uh, the free will determinism dichotomy is interesting to me. It certainly is interesting. Just uh, remember free will is overrated. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, so today, <laughs> I'm sorry, this week, um, Tim Holmes, who's a colleague of mine and I, uh, have been um, conducting a global internet conference um, to help maintain the psychic balance of, the, um, of our species. And I'm going to put the link for the next event that we're going to do, which is on Sunday. Um, and so this is the global Corona virus check-in. And uh, we'd like you all to join us. Um, and on Sundays, uh, it's going to be uh, at this link. And what this is, is a, let's call it a mental balancing activity, a, a kind of ritual that we're instituting where we're trying to help people around the world um, maintain their psychic balance at a time that is going to be very, very difficult for everyone. I mean, if, um, if the low numbers are right and there are going to be 100,000 deaths in the country, in the United States only, in the next uh, four to six weeks, uh, everybody is going to be in mourning because everybody will know somebody that has died. And we, this is a total experiment on the human species. We have no idea how that is going to affect people how they will come out of it changed. Uh, we're not going to be going back to the original normal that we had. Uh, there'll be a new normal after we have a vaccine. But for myself, I'm looking at uh, the next 18 months in quarantine because uh, I, I'm in one of the high risk categories. So I can't get this disease uh, if I do these videos may end. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that uh, this conference that we are offering on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and uh, Sundays uh, is going to be important for everybody's psychic balance. Let me give you the, um, I'll give you the links for the check-in for the other days because they're, they're on different uh, Zoom conferences. So Tuesdays, so um, what I'm going to put up next, uh, the one that I have already put up is for Sundays. Uh, for Tuesdays, this is the link. And for Thursdays, let me get that one as well. So after you've checked in for one of the three days, you won't have to recheck in for future sessions um, on that day of the week. But there are three Zoom conference dates. 
So you'll have to check in three times if you want to attend all three days. Uh, I've originally scheduled this for seven weeks, but I think Tim Holmes and I uh, think that this is going to be a continuing activity. Uh, today we went for two hours and you can find our what happened in that session uh, on um, on the YouTube channel. And in that session this morning, which was only the second time we've done it, we had uh, eight countries and nine US states um, logging in, uh, which included, uh, I'll just give you the countries, um, Portugal, Spain, Peru, United Kingdom, Canada, India, Peru, um, you know, we got Peru and uh, the United States. And the states that were represented were Maryland, Montana, Kentucky, Florida, Canada, Nevada, Vermont, North Carolina, Hawaii, and Illinois. Um, one of my uh, friends who happens to be a psychiatrist has uh, gathered three of her friends to start participating with us and they are having to log on at 5 a.m. They obviously feel that it's valuable. So I hope more of you as you hear about it uh, will start to uh, join our check-ins. These are being conducted at 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The reason for that time is because it reaches about 75% of the world's population. It's obviously very painful for uh, people in um, Korea and Japan and uh, Australia, uh, but uh, yeah, and Australia. Um, and for them, they should in, uh, attend our normal Monday night session, which is at 8 p.m. use. U.S. Eastern Time, so that would make it uh, in the morning, um, in the morning for Australia, Korea, and Japan, and uh, so we will be uh, doing dedicating a part of our regular Monday night meeting uh, to this check-in, also as a way to help everyone. Uh, maintain mental balance. And I hope that you'll all uh, feel free to join us and uh, become a part of it over time. Uh, one of the things that we need when we're going through difficult times is we need ritual. And so uh, you can think of this as a ritual. And um, uh, you hear some very interesting stories. We, all, we already did in the first two days that we've done this, and you can hear those on uh, this YouTube channel. Um, so you'll find sessions one and two on the YouTube channel, and, um, and we'll be doing another one uh, on Sunday. And so uh, please check this chat uh, for the correct uh, links because the the links are different depending on the day of the week that you're coming on, and uh, so anyway. I'm, uh, but I digress from my reading. I am going to do my best to continue my daily readings at 4:30 p.m. And so I've completed four of the eight parts of this book. Uh, I'm sorry, not of the book, but of the essay. Uh, the spirit of psych, uh, the spirit of psychology, which is in this book, Spirit and Nature. Uh, it's volume one of this Aranos series, uh, papers from the Aranos yearbooks, edited by Joseph Campbell. And so I hope you'll uh, listen to all of these um, readings as time goes on. I do not set these readings so that there is a webinar when I'm doing it, because that would be too distracting. Um, but um, 
you know, our other events, our webinars, and you will be able to participate uh, online with the rest of the panel. And I hope that you will do that. Um, so with that, I'm going to say goodbye for this afternoon. And I'll be back uh, tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. with part five. Thank you for joining me today.